Now, it turns out that there's a whole nother aspect in terms of maintaining the health of the brain, inflammation in the brain, and that's the gut-brain axis. So <clears throat> this, the gut-brain axis is this bidirectional communication that goes between the brain and the gut. It's mediated via the autonomic nervous system, the enteric nervous system, the endocrine hypothalamic pituitary adren adrenal system, the immune system, and the humoral systems. It includes viruses and parasites in the gut microbiome. So the first thing we want to look at, we know the anatomy of the brain, let's talk about the anatomy of the gut. All right? The anatomy of the gut includes the gut microbiome. That is all the things that are living in our gut. And there's a huge number of things living in our gut. All right? And they are made up of viruses and parasites and bacteria. The reality of the matter is bacteria is 99% of the DNA sitting in our guts. All right? There are over 100 trillion microorganisms in the gastrointestinal tract, most of them in the large intestine. There's 150 times more genes in the gastrointestinal tract than in the human genome. This is a massive organism sitting within us. It's bigger than we are genetically. It's bigger than we are in number of cells. And it is very much a part of who we are in terms of communication with the brain. So we need to understand it in order to understand its effects on our health. There's over a thousand different species of bacteria. Better than 90% of the species of bacteria are made up of the Bacteroidetes and the Firmicumides. Okay? So we're trying to understand what happens in that balance or imbalance of the gut microbiota that has impacts on our health. So what does the gut microbiota do? Well, we know that it protects us against infections. All right, it's all these bacteria and stuff. That balance helps fight off and prevent other things from overgrowing and taking place. It modulates the immune process. It regulates our metabolism, digestion of food. It makes vitamins. All right, it modulates the CNS functions, the gut-brain axis. It controls the maturation and development of the enteric nervous system and the central nervous system. So the enteric nervous system, the nervous system that governs the gut, and the central nervous system, obviously, the brain and spinal cord. We also know that the health of the gut microbiome influences our resilience, our ability to withstand external stressors and recover from them. It has impact on memory via regulation, at least, a brain-derived neurotropic factor. It has impact on cognitive functioning, and it also impacts the blood-brain barrier. If the gut-blood barrier is not intact, the blood-brain barrier is not intact. That really opens you up to a bunch of problems. You cannot have a healthy brain if you do not have a healthy gut. We know that babies born th through the vaginal birth have different microbiomes than babies who are born via C-section. Do we know that that makes one baby healthier than the other? We do not. We just know that they're different for right now. We're still trying to sort all this out. We know that the, in childhood, the gut microbiome begins to assume the adult composition, typically ages three to four. By that time, the composition of the gut microbiome in the child is pretty much the same as what you're going to see in the adult. Involved in the gut-brain axis is the microbiota, so that huge amount of bacteria, uh, viruses, and other material, genetic material sitting in our gut. The autonomic nervous system, the neuroendocrine and neuroimmune systems, and components of the central nervous system. So there's a lot of ways information travels back and forth. The vagus nerve is by far and away the most direct in terms of communication. And in fact, we've seen situations where, in otherwise non-responsive depressions, putting on a vas vagal nerve stimulator can, in fact, shut down the depressive symptoms. We know that there's cytokines and neuropeptides and neurotransmitters, small chain fatty acids, microbial byproducts and lymphatic circulation, meaning that there's a lot of different pathways going on, so it's not just one thing. And that's why if we attempt to fix one thing, there may be six other ways that it's actually, the communication is still going on and is still aberrant. So we have to pay attention to the totality of it, not just pieces of it. So we look at germ-free mice. 
Germ-free mice don't have any germs. And they displayed defects in microglia with altered cell uh, proportions and an immune phenotype leading to impaired innate immune system. Why is this important? This tells us that the composition of the gut microbiome directly impacts the composition of the innate immune system in the central nervous system. If we recolonize these guys, we give them good healthy bacteria, we see an improvement in microglial function. Okay? Healthy gut, healthy brain. Unhealthy gut, unhealthy brain. In adult germ-free mice, we see marked trans disruptions in neurotransmitter levels, plasticity, related proteins such as brain-derived neurotropic factor, the ability of the brain to repair itself and grow, increased stress response, they do not have the resilience. Marked changes in anxiety and social behavior. Okay? These are nervous Nellies. These guys are a mess. They don't play well with others because they don't have a healthy gut microbiome. As such, they do not have a healthy brain. We see disruption in the adult germ-free mice of the blood-brain barrier. We see disruption and we understand that the microbiota is essential for normal adult hippocampus neurogenesis. neurogenesis. Long time ago, slides back, I mentioned the fact that the balance of the hippocampus versus the amygdala is crucial in terms of regulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal stress axis. All right. Here we see a direct impact of the gut microbiota disrupting the hippocampal region and giving us an understanding of how that imbalance then causes disruption of the HPA. Disruption of the HPA then causes disruption of the microbiota. It's all connected. All right, cortisol activity being disrupted is going to cause problems with the way the gut functions. So we can't be ignoring any of this if we're going to be successful in treating people who are struggling with chronic illness and chronic pain. This is a systemic disease and we need to treat it systemically. Other factors that we see very important are small ch short chain fatty acids, uh, acetic acid, propionic acid, and butyric acid are all the short chain fatty acids that we see. They're bacterial metabolites derived from fermentation. They are, if you will, postbiotics. They're anti-inflammatory in nature. They impact the microglial density. Okay, short-chain fatty acids in the gut determine the density of microglia, the functioning of microglia in the central nervous system. All right, they can restore deficits in the blood-brain barrier if you have healthy amounts of them. Unhealthy gut, unhealthy brain. Loss of diversity. So we're talking about in disease. What do we see in the microbiota of the brain? The biggest thing that we see is we see loss of diversity, which we call dysbiosis. All right? There should be a wide range of bacteria, viruses, and other things in the, in the gut. We see a narrowing of that population. We see disruption specifically in the Firmicurides and the Bacteroidetes uh, ratio toward a pro-inflammatory phenotype. These guys should predominate. These should be the smaller number. And as that ratio changes, we see more inflammation in the gut. We see problems with intestinal permeability when there's gut dysbiosis. We see problems with disruption of the normal microglial functioning. All right? And we see disruptions of the HPA axis. This is always going back and forth. The research tells us that we can't overlook this. The research tells us unhealthy gut, unhealthy microglia, unhealthy brain. Unhealthy gut, disruption of the blood-brain barrier, Unhealthy gut, unhealthy brain. Healthy gut, healthy brain. All right? We cannot overlook the gut-brain axis in terms of its importance in addressing chronic inflammatory disease in the central nervous system. We know that disruption in the, in the, uh, in the gut microbiome has been now associated with anxiety and depressive disorders, autism spectrum disorders, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease. Neuroinflammatory, 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 neuroinflammatory. Not sure. We have seen alterations in the gut microbiome associated with chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, 
visceral pain, migraine, fibromyalgia, and arthritis. So it's not, I'm walking you through this to understand that it's not just a matter of an opinion that the problem in the gut results in problems in the brain, but that we not only see the specific correlations in terms of damage to cellular function in the central nervous system when we see damage in the gut, but now we're also starting to see the correlations coming out in what we see clinically. So the issue actually manifests in pain problems. The issues actually manifest in depressive problems. This is particularly disturbing. Our results clearly show a linear correlation between morphine-mediated microbial dysbiosis, disruption of cholesterol bile acid metabolism, and barrier disrupting, promoting sustained inflammation of the host. Yet another reason not to use opioids. Does this mean that you never, ever, ever use opioids? No. But you have to be extremely thoughtful about it because we know it's impacting the entire system. It has direct impact on microglia. It has direct impact on the gut microbiome, the end result of which is we may be making things much worse, not better. Short-term use is one thing. Long-term use, we're reprogramming the system potentially to upregulate and cause more pain.